so we were discussing about kernel q sub no kernel test okay so let me remind you we have reference data this is x1 to xn is it n or m can you check how many data points did i have for x for the reference N? Yes. Okay. So I have reference data, I have current data, Y1 to Ym, and I need to have the hypothesis. This is all, this is IID mu naught, this is IID mu 1. And my null hypothesis is mu naught equals to mu 1. My alternate hypothesis is mu naught not equals to mu 1. <clears throat> so basically whatever is the distribution of the reference data and in this case mu naught mu 1 unknown. I don't know what, what mu naught and mu one looks like. I don't even have the parametric form of mu naught or mu one. I don't even know if it is Gaussian or exponential or whatever, some, what distribution it has. I really have no idea about the distribution. All I have is the reference data and the current data. So reference data is data from yesterday, current data is data from today. And we have a kernel function k as a function of x and y. And the statistics that I had written, mmd square I'm going to use hat to show that this is actually an approximation between mu naught and mu one is equal to This is just a, a recall from the previous class. And uh, here i is not equal to j here, i is not equal to j here, it's over the entire index at i and j. Here i and j goes from 1 to m, here i and j goes from uh, 1 to n, and here i and j goes from, i goes from 1 to m, j goes from 1 to n. And this is an approximation, this is an approximation of the true MMD between mu naught and mu 1, MMD is the distance between mu naught and mu one, the two distributions, and it's an approximation of the distance. The other thing you will notice is it's completely data driven. I'm not using any information about the distribution mu naught and mu one. So once I pick a kernel, I can just compute this value. And as new data comes in, as new ym comes in, I need to keep updating this particular term. I need to keep adding j equals one to m term and then I need to add some terms here, right? So I can, as new data arrives, I can keep adding more and more data to it, and I can compute the MMD square sequentially. Any question so far? No, okay. This is just a recap from the previous class. 
Now, if m is equal to n, then I can simplify this expression a little bit. So I'm going to look at m equals to n case, and I'm going to define a function h of x1, x2, y1, y2, and this is given by So I'm adding the two kernels and then subtracting the two kernels, the cross terms, x1, y2, and x2, y1. And then I can write this particular term for this particular case. This is summation I not equals to J. Well, I'll not write it here. Let me write it on the other side. This is when m is equal to n. Have we used h so far? I don't think we have used h so far, so I think this is fine. So the rejection region here is going to be tau infinity. So as you are computing this uh, MMD square, MMD hat square, so this is an estimate of MMD square. And uh, as you are computing this MMD square, uh, by the way, I'm writing it as square, but it can take negative value because sometimes this term could dominate the additions of these two terms. So that's why it's an estimate because the true MMD will always be non-negative. But in this case, when you are computing, when you are approximating it, sometimes it could be negative. Okay, so don't go by the square term here. It, they, because this is an estimate, it could be negative. But generally it is, uh, uh, but in the case of true MMD, it is always non-negative. Okay. Uh, so the idea here is that as you are computing this MMD square, MMD hat square, uh, if the value of MMD hat square is above a certain threshold, you can raise an alarm saying that alternative hypothesis is true. On the other hand, if MMD hat square is small, then you have to say that H naught is true. The Null hypothesis is true. Okay. Now we want to come up with some variations of this particular algorithm. So this is uh, going back to 2012. So this is an algorithm that came out in 2012. And so, uh, of course, after 2012, a lot of people have contributed to this literature, uh, including our research group. So uh, let's try to talk about some of the other variations of this algorithm that people have studied. So the first thing is the kernel Q sum.
I'm going to define h of delta. So the first of all, uh, delta is positive. So this h function, I'm just going to subtract a delta value from this h function. And I'm going to create pairs of x1 and x2. So I'm going to look at x2i minus 1, x2i, and y2i minus 1, y of 2i. So I'm taking data set of equal size. I need to give it a name. What should I call it? Z is already used, X is used, Y is used. W, have we used W so far? No, right? Okay, so I'm going to call it WI. Oh, we have used W for uh, actuation noise. W is also used, U is also used. V, uh, V is observation noise. S, have we used S? S is cu cumulative sum, okay. <laughs> okay, we'll just go with WI. Okay, so I'm going to create pairs of X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, X6, and so on and so forth. I'm going to create pairs of Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, Y5, Y6, and so on. So that gives me this, I'm going to call it wi. And one thing you should remember is this h actually takes as input w. So it takes as input pairs of x and a pair of y, right? Pair of x and a pair of y. So that's what I'm doing here. And then the zi plus one is max zero zi plus h delta wi z0 equals to 0 <clears throat> this is kernel q sum and again the rejection region is tau infinity Let's go over the algorithm again. So what is this kernel Q sum saying? So if mu naught is equal to mu one, this MMT hat square is going to be close to zero uh, because they, the two x1 to xn and yn to ym, they are all coming from the same distribution. Uh, so mu naught is equal to mu one. So this term is going to be close to zero, which means that this term is going to be, so if mu naught is equal to mu one, then this term is going to be negative, more or less, most of the time it's going to be negative because you are subtracting. This term is going to be close to zero. And so you are subtracting a negative value from it. Uh, sorry, you are subtracting a positive value from it. So this term is going to be largely negative. So this term, when I'm using it here and suppose mu naught is equal to mu one. So zi will have something subtracted from zi and that gives you zi plus one. There is a max of zero here. So it cannot go below zero. It will always be at zero. And if you're trying to push it down, it will just slide along the surface, along the zero line. And then if, if mu naught is not equal to mu one in the alternate hypothesis situation, uh, this term will become positive. Mostly it will be positive. You subtract a small negative term, it will still remain positive. And so zi will start growing 
as is the case in all QSUM algorithms. So you plot ZI This is your time t or maybe i, index i. This is your zi and generally it will be, it will be zero, it will go up and then go to zero. It will never go below zero and then the change happens and then it's going to start increasing. This is when the change happens. So you can progressively compute the value of the zi plus one as you get more and more data about y. And then eventually, this thing will, zi will start blowing up whenever mu naught is not equal to mu one. And then you will see this zi blowing up at some point of time. <clears throat> Where are people using this algorithm? They're using it for authentication also. Like if you have voice, your XI could be like your voice signal and YI could be also your voice signal, right? So Y1 to M and then they are trying to test whether the two distributions are the same, which means that it's the same person who's speaking the reference signal. It's the same person who's speaking right now or somebody else is speaking right now. So people are using this algorithm in various places across the different domains. We are, of course, studying it in the context of cybersecurity, but it's used in other areas as well. Or rather, I should say people are exploring the use of this algorithm in other areas also. Okay. Uh, so that's the kernel QSUM. Any question on this? So one of the drawbacks of the current algorithms that we have talked about so far are as follows. So imagine that we are talking about this building, we are talking about the temperature sensor, the temperature reading of this room. And so the reference data is from yesterday. I have X1 to Xn. And the current data is the current temperature readings of the room, so last one hour or two hours of temperature reading. And the problem is that I have a large amount of reference data, but I have very small amount of current data, right? So the question is, if you have very large reference data, if you have data set that goes all the way to minus infinity, so I'm collecting information all the way from minus infinity until now, how can I come up with a progressively good uh, estimation scheme for this MMD hat square and then use that for doing this change detection. So that is known as a scan B test. So let's talk about that test. Everything remains the same. So I'm going to create X B I. This is so I want to pick B B items from this data set. So N is very, very large. So I want to pick B objects, B uh, X from this particular data set. How should I write it? Uh, B samples. Samples from, should I call this X from X? I is already used, uh, J, K. Let me use K here. And K goes from K 
कैपिटल के एंड माई वाई भी वाई टी माइनस बी प्लस वन वाई टी टी इज द करेंट टाइम So B is the block length. Let, let me call B as block length. So I picked B samples from uh, the set X, capital X. So I've picked B samples from yesterday, and I'm looking at the last B samples produced by the temperature sensors. So T is the current time, and I'm going all the way. B readings, so I have B readings here, and I have B samples from X1, and I'm uh, from X from the past data, and the thing is I'm going to take K such samples from the past data. So XPK means that I'm picking, this is the kth round of picking B samples from X. So I went back to yesterday, and I picked, let's say, 3 to 4 p.m. data, 4 to 5 p.m. data, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. data. So that's like one, one hours of data. So B samples is like one hour of data. And then I have maybe three hours or four hours or 10 hours of data. Now, I can compute the estimate of MMD square, mu naught, mu one, just by picking this particular thing. So uh, let me keep it as m m minus one, and I'm going to call this I have to come up with another notation, but I don't want to come up with another notation. Uh, let's see. I'm going to define ZBT as one over capital K summation k equals 1 to capital K. MMD hat square. And now I'm just, instead of writing mu naught and mu 1, I'm going to write x, p, k, and y, b, t. And my rejection region, as always, is tau infinity. So I'm using the samples from yesterday and the samples from today. So sam samples of uh, one hour of data from yesterday and then uh, last one hour of data today. Uh, and then I'm computing the MMD hat square, and then I'm averaging over all the past, all the data from yesterday. So I might have 24 hours of data from yesterday. So I'm going to average it out over 24 hour period. Okay, that is this particular algorithm doing. And then I'm going to take the rejection region to be tau and infinity, as has been the case for many of the other algorithms as well. Okay, is this algorithm clear? No? How do you know how much data you need to pick? Yes. So there are two variables here. One is one variable is B. So what is the block length? Should it be half an hour, one hour, two hours, 10 hours? So that's one data point, B, that you need to pick. And the other one is K, which is how many hours of data or how many minutes of data you need to pick. How do you know it's appropriate data set? Uh, 
uh, it all depends on what is the error accuracy you want. Like what's the probability of error you want in this particular situation. So you will have to, like depending on the situation, you might have to have, uh, you might have to run several tests with different values of B and different values of capital K. And then you can, uh, um, then you can test which one does well for your specific application. And for the specific uh, uh, probability of errors that you are, that is desired for your application. So when you're doing, for instance, when you go to, has anyone used clear or the airport? Do you know what clear service is? So it basically detects your retina and then tells you if you are the person who's flying or not flying. So it does like identity check at the airport. Or, or, of course, your phones also do fingerprint detection and you know a lot of detection algorithms are there. So typically in those kind of applications, you want the probability of error to be 10 raised to minus six, let's say, okay? So one in a million times, there can be an error in authenticating, but otherwise there shouldn't be any error in authenticating. Okay, so now depending on that requirement that okay, the error rate has to be one in a million, how exactly like what algorithm will give you that sort of um, accuracy, uh, you will have to run several tests and figure out which one gives you that particular accuracy. So you start with the accuracy or you start with the probability of error and then you figure out what the value of B and what the value of K should be. Another thing to note here is that the samples are not repeated. So if you have picked a sample for K equals to one, then you don't use that sample for K equals to two and K equals to three and so on. So every time you sample it, you remove it from the set capital X and then you create the next B samples from the set capital X. So let me write it without replacement. So once you have picked it, you don't pick it again. So you can't create, like if you have picked uh, 3 to 4 p.m. data here, then you have to start from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. You can't have like 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. data in XB2. Okay, so that's without replacement. It has to be distinct data set. You can't have overlap between different data sets. So that's called a scan B. This is known as a scan B test statistic. And that's this algorithm. As you increase the value of B and capital N, sorry, as you increase the value of B and as you increase the value of capital K, uh, you get a much better and better value of ZBT. Okay, so better value as in it's more accurate. And once you have a very accurate value of ZBT, of course your algorithm becomes much, much stronger. So you increase the size of B, you increase the size of K, you will have a much better algorithm for detection. Any questions so far? Yes, please. No, so you're looking at the last B time step. So you need to know whether in the last B time step the attack has happened or not. So let's say the, let's say we are sampling the temperature every one minute. And the, the facilities management at the university says, you need to tell me if an attack is happening within five minutes. Okay, so the attack starts, I need to know within five minutes if the attack is happening or not, right? So then you will most likely pick the value of B to be five because you have only five samples, right? After the attack starts, you can only have five samples. So you pick the value of B to be five and then you look at yesterday's five minutes of data, you create blocks of five minutes of data and then you compute this. And then, you know, the, the time shifts. So now you are looking at 3.06 p.m. So the T becomes 3.06 p.m. So you'll start with 3.01 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4, 3, 0, let me write it. So your B equals to five. You have one sample per minute. So you will look at 301, 
then 3O2, then 3O3, oh, I made a mistake, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay, 301, we don't need that. So right now it's 3.06 p.m. So I'm going to look at the last five minutes of reading. So I get five readings of YT, and then I pick the five minutes of reading from yesterday, several five minutes of reading from yesterday, and I compute this, and then I check whether an attack is happening or not. And then it becomes 3.07 p.m., then I look at last five minutes of data, so I'll start with 3.03 p.m., look at last five minutes of data, and then do the calculation all over again. Okay. So as T changes, as the current time changes, you look at just the last five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes of data in order to come up with the detection algorithm. And then you might go back and say to the university that look, if you only pick B equals to five, like if you want to know the attack detection within five minutes, uh, the probability of error is going to be very high. So then the university will come back to you and say, okay, fine, we'll make it 15 minutes. Okay, now you have 15 data points. Now your attack algorithm will be much, much better. Like the detection algorithm will be much, much better because now you have more data to play with for detection. Any other question? No? Okay. All right, so that's all I wanted to talk about in the context of uh, kernel-based attack detection algorithm. So now, we'll start talking about dynamical systems. We'll talk about Markov processes, which is useful for the next assignment. So remember we were talking about uh, conditional probability distribution. P of x prime given x. Okay, so now I don't have a static system. So I'm looking at the temperature of this room and the temperature of this room is not static. In fact, it has a special dependent structure that the temperature at 3 p.m. is actually a small perturbation to temperature at 2.59 p.m. Temperature at 3.01 p.m. is a small perturbation to the temperature at 3 p.m. and so on and so forth. So this kind of process is known as a Markov process. So your Xt depends on Xt minus one, and only Xt minus one. So the way to mathematically write it is probability of Xt given x1 to xt minus 1 is equal to probability of xt given xt minus 1. Okay, and I'm writing everything in discrete space uh, because the continuous space uh, idea also follows from the same principle. Okay, so my current time, T, is 3.35 p.m. T minus one is 3.34 p.m. T minus two is 3.33 p.m. and so on. Let me add more data points, 2024, what is the date today? 10, 18, and so on.
Okay. So I'm looking at the XT right now and I'm going back to the entire history. So this room, this building was probably built in 1960s. Okay, so I look at the temperature reading of this room all the way from 1960 until today, until the last minute. And it turns out that the temperature of the room currently is dependent only on the temperature of the last minute and not on any of the stuff that happened in the last 50, 60 years of this room's existence. So this is known as a Markov process. So XT only depends on XT minus one and doesn't depend on anything else. Can you think of a non-Markov process? A process where there is a very long dependence on the history? I'm also trying to think. What process will have very long dependence? Ah, okay. A very important example. So, when I'm showering in the morning, the water for maybe like 30 seconds is very cold and then hot water starts coming in, okay? So that's a case where there is a lot of delay, like uh, the temperature, no, maybe that's not a good example. I'm trying to figure out under what conditions would you see a dependence with something that happened way back in the past. Yeah. Could maybe the trajectory of like a rocket be an example? Because it would depend on initial conditions and then everything else happened up until then. No, but you always keep track of the, uh, the location of the rocket. So the location at the next time step is a function of location at the current time step and the velocity. So rocket is not a good example. Um, typically processes with delays are very good examples of it. So, okay, very, uh, another example. So when you are drilling the hole in the ocean for taking out oil, so remember the drill is at the, the like the motor or whatever that, that thing that rotates the drill is actually at the ship. The ship is 5,000 meters above the seabed. So the thing rotates at the top, but it doesn't start rotating all the way at the bottom. That whole wave actually travels all the way to the bottom. Uh, and then it rotates the drill at the bottom and then it basically, I don't know, extracts oil or digs a hole in the ocean bed. Okay, so in that case, what happens is what if you, if you were sitting at the bottom of the ocean and you were looking at that thing that's supposed to rotate, the people at the top has already started rotating, but it's not rotating at the bottom. You know, it's going to take five minutes for that whole wave to travel all the way down to the bottom of the ocean and start rotating the drill. So for five minutes, you're like sitting and waiting that okay, it'll start like, from the ship, you got a call that okay, I've started rotating it, but you won't really see anything for five minutes. And then after that, you will start seeing it ro start rotating. Okay, so those are the situation where, because of the delay in the process, it's kind of sort of not a, not a Markov process anymore, because there is a lot of information that it takes some time for the information to reach back. So I'll give you an example in this. So suppose the drill is about to break in the bottom, okay, because of stress or whatever. Now, you can call them up and say, hey, the drill is about to break in like half a minute. But remember, they have already, even if they stop the rotation, that, that wave is going to travel all the way for five minutes and it's going to break the drill. In fact, this is a very big problem in oil extraction. Like the drill breaks very often for obvious reasons, but the information takes a lot more time to propagate all the way up. So you need to be able to tell the person up in the ship that this drill is going to break in like 30 minutes and then they can stop the process 30 minutes before rather than waiting it all the way to break and then start repairing the whole thing. So anyways, uh, that's a case which is not a Markov process, but generally if you're looking at temperature of the room, a rocket, uh, 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 water flow in a river, all of those are processes that are Markov process, where XT, the water flow in the river at time T depends on the water flow at the river at time T minus one, plus some errors, some noise, some 
some small stochastic process that gets added to xt minus 1 in order to get to xt. So when we talk about control systems, uh, when you look at the queuing system, so you have done the queuing example now, right? So if you look at your Q, Q length at time t, it depends on Q length at time t minus 1 and then new arrivals that have happened between t minus 1 and time t, okay? So that's also a Markov process. So the way you define the Markov process is by the transition kernels. called P of xt given xt minus 1. And throughout this course, we are going to assume that the transition kernel doesn't depend on time. So P does not depend on time t. OK. Now you have, uh, if you look at the probability distribution between x1 to xt, this is given by p of xt given xt minus 1, p of xt minus 1 given xt minus 2, p of x2 given x1 times probability of x1. This is the joint distribution. This is one step conditional distribution, all of which gets multiplied, times the distribution of the initial state. So far, uh, we have been talking about the case of IID distribution. So let's see how it differs from this case. In the IID case, P of xt given xt minus 1 was equal to P of xt. So there was no dependence with respect to the random variable you have observed in the past. And so this one was just p of xt multiplied by p of xt minus 1 all the way up to p of x1. That was the IID case. That was the case we were looking at until now. But suddenly, we are now looking at the case where you have dependence with respect to the past. But the immediate past, you don't have dependence all the way going back. Uh, but you have dependence with respect to the immediate past. So now we are looking at uh, this particular situation, the Markov situation, which is different from the IID case where there was no dependence with respect to the past. Now what can change in this particular scenario? Now in the IID case, we were looking at a change in this probability distribution. So we were saying that, okay, uh, x0 to x1, uh, sorry, x0 to xm comes from distribution mu0, y1 to ym comes from distribution uh, mu1. So we were looking at the, the change in the distribution itself. Now in this case, in the case of Markov chain, we are looking for a change in the transition kernel. So in this case, my h0 would be that x1 to xn xt, let me call it t, because now there is an explicit notion of time. We are not looking at samples, but we are looking at time. Comes from transition kernel p. And ha alternate hypothesis
comes from transition kernel Q and whether P is equal to Q or P is not equal to Q. That is the hypothesis testing problem that we will be studying. Once again, we will have the situation wherein uh, I know the transition kernels P and Q, so I got a penetration tester. I asked the pen tester to attack my system. The pen tester did some configuration and attacked the system. So I estimate what the transition kernel under attack is. I know what the transition kernel under no attack is. And then I want to test whether the system is under attack or under no attack. The other situation could be, you know the transition kernel under attack, sorry, without attack because that's the usual operations of the system, but you don't know what attack uh, attacker is going to do, so I don't quite know what Q transition kernel under attack is going to look like. So I need to estimate Q and then figure out what the, how to run the hypothesis test in that case. And then the third case would be, I don't know what the transition kernel before attack is. I don't know what the transition kernel after attack is. Uh, but I have clean data. I have clean data from yesterday, day before yesterday, 10 days ago. And I know that the clean data was unattacked because I know from my experience that nothing happened, nothing wrong happened on that particular day. So this is unattacked. Uh, so I have clean data, but I don't know what the transition kernel is. And I have the current data and I don't know what the transition kernel is under attack. So we'll have all these three situations and we'll try to come up with algorithms for all these situations. So the first algorithm we'll come up with would be the log likelihood algorithm for computing this change in the transition kernel. And then we will talk about, uh, we'll talk about the case with unknown Q where what we will do is we'll try to estimate Q and then we will try to come up with the hypothesis test and then in the case of unknown P and unknown Q, you, we'll come up with a kernel-based test that we just talked about. We'll extend that IID test to the Markov chain one, and then we'll talk about how to detect the attack in that particular scenario. The case with unknown P and unknown Q is actually, uh, it was done by my PhD student who's still around, so we'll get to that algorithm maybe on, on Wednesday next week, and we'll talk about the algorithm he designed where both P and Q were unknown. All right. Uh, oh, I still have five minutes. Any question? Okay. Uh, I guess I don't want to start a new topic today, uh, but uh, next class we'll talk about the case with known P, known Q, known P, unknown Q, and then on Wednesday, we'll talk about unknown P and unknown Q. Okay? All right. Thank you so much. I'll see you on Monday.